Good morning, bonjour, 晚上好 Welcome everyone to the launch of our survey report How China Sees the World in 2023. My name is Jia Wang. I'm the interim director of the China Institute at the University of Alberta and one of the main contributors to this survey report. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Our program today will begin with a presentation and discussion of the key findings from our Chinese Citizens Global Perception Survey to be followed by Q&A. We encourage our audience members to submit your questions using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can find our full report now live by visiting our website listed in the chat. The rising tension between China and Western nations has centered on China using its growing economic and political might to assert its influence worldwide. Such tensions have led Western countries to consider China as economic and military competitor, a systematic rival, and at the same time, a negotiating partner on selecting select global issues. But a greater focus has been placed on competition and rivalry. Though China repeatedly appears in media headlines, there's very little understanding backed by quantifiable research of how the Chinese public perceive their country's international roles and its relationship with major foreign powers. In our modest attempt, our report aims to address this gap. In addition to offering insights into Chinese public perception of major global jurisdictions, we endeavor to highlight the complexities of public sentiments and their effects on China's international behavior. How Chinese citizens perceive the world has profound implications for China's future behavior, both domestically and abroad. Our survey examined mainland Chinese residents' perspectives on the country's current relations with global actors, including Australia, Canada, the EU, France, Germany, India, Japan, Russia, the UK and the US. This report discussed key findings in five main areas. Namely, Chinese citizens' general global perception, China's global roles, foreign tourism study, work and immigration preferences, Canada-China relations, and finally, Chinese citizens' sources and knowledge of global jurisdictions. Now, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce my esteemed colleague and lead author, Dr. Reza Hasmas, whom I had the pleasure of working very closely with over the past few months on this project. Dr. Hasmas is a professor of political science at the University of Alberta and academic advisor of the China Institute. He received his PhD from the University of Cambridge and has previously held faculty positions at the Universities of Toronto, Melbourne, and Oxford. Professor Hasmas is a, pop, is a very productive author and has worked for think tanks, consultancies, uh, development agencies, and NGOs around the world. Riza, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to say a few words to you about this survey that we've uh, just launched. Um, bear with me while I launch the uh, the PowerPoint deck. Um, okay. Excellent. So mm -hmm. as Shai has actually mentioned, uh, we have seen these sort of rising tensions between China and Western jurisdictions in the last few years, particularly in this decade. Um, and in fact, we, a lot of the sort of conversations has been about decoupling from China. Um, and in, in fact, what we did see is earlier this week, uh, the G7, at the G7 summit, we saw uh, this idea that, well, Western jurisdictions are not necessarily decoupling from China, but th then they went on to suggest ways in which they might actually decouple China. So even if you do have the rhetoric of, of decoupling or not decoupling, at the end of the day, we see around many Western jurisdictions is a, a wariness towards China. So it's, there's, a, there's a movement towards de-risking from China. Um, 
So ultimately, we can suggest that China is perceived as a negotiating partner on select global issues, as an economic and military competitor, and a systemic rival promoting alternative models of governance. Now, as just sort of hinted, you know, how Chinese citizens uh, perceive the world has profound implications for China's future domestically and abroad. So while the Communist Party of China enjoys a monopoly over the political system, it does actually require political popular support and legitimacies for its policies. I mean, this has been quite historical where um, the party has re retained that sort of legitimacy from the, the, from the populace. Um, and, and in many respects, we can see this being reiterated by the fact that the party monitors public opinion, uh, they conduct public uh, opinion analysis. Um, so ultimately, it suggests that the general public support or dissatisfaction with China's foreign policy and activities can translate to future support or dissatisfaction with the party and the state itself. But differently, it's worthwhile for us to understand what the Chinese public thinks. Now, there has been surveys um, and polls conducted looking at what the Chinese public thinks. Um, so what, 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 what makes this sort of, this, the CCGPS survey, the Chinese Citizens Global Perception Survey, somewhat unique is that we're doing not only a, an online sort of survey, but we're doing a telephone survey as well. And what that means, it, what distinguishes it, is that we are able to get a much more representative sample of the Chinese population. We're able to get those hidden populations, the rural populations, through the methodologies we've utilized. Um, so unlike polls or flash polls that we might see coming out of China, uh, over the last um, first quarter of 2023, we, we ultimately queried citizens um, from a geographical standpoint, from an income standpoint, uh, variations in terms of um, uh, marital status, uh, education levels, gender, age, uh, to have a representative sample and a statistically representative sample of how the Chinese general public views other jurisdictions and their relationships with China. So we looked at 10 different jurisdictions, as uh, Xiao mentioned. Um, and you can see that there was the Australia's, the Canada, the EU, France, Germany, India, Japan, Russia, the UK, and the United States. So that's the sort of the methodological approach we undertook there. We um, used a, um, a, a a sort of uh, a survey sort of company uh, that is semi-detached a university. Um, and so we were able to um, utilize their experiences as well as our own experiences doing many surveys in China. Uh, to leverage this sort of data. Um, we ran data checks as well, uh, so academic data checks at an academic standard. So we're super confident in the sort of um, validity of the sort of findings that we have here. So uh, beyond that, let me say a few words about general global perception. And let's get let's talk about more of the major findings we have from the survey. The first thing to point out, and this should not be surprising to those on this call, um, is that the United States is, is seen by the Chinese public as the most influential global power, outweighing other jurisdictions by substantial margin. Russia and the EU were perceived to be the second and third most powerful jurisdictions, respectively. We're going to see throughout this report and the survey that Russia scores quite favorably um, uh, throughout most of the indicators we examine. Um, interestingly enough, despite having uh, a, a vast population, a growing economy, and possession of nuclear weapons, India was perceived as the lowest score out of all nations. Also, when we look at the European Union as a conglomerate versus Germany and France, we start seeing some variations there. So it's kind of interesting to see uh, how the public perceives the conglomerate um, of the EU versus, say, uh, two very influential member states of the EU. Uh, Canada scores at 4.2. Now, remember throughout these, this, this particular survey uh, results, we're using a, a, a seven-point Likert scale. So four is seen as the average or the norm. Uh, anything below that or above that is seen with some sort of uh, relevance, statistically anyways. So the key headline here is that the majority of respondents saw the United States as the most influential global power. Now, what's really fascinating is when we look at trust in global partners, now, trust is super important. Um, you have to trust an entity in order to engage in a meaningful sort of engagement with that entity. But differently, uh, if you are going to engage with China or if China is going to engage with a Western jurisdiction, it, they need to have minimum levels of trust. 
So looking at trust is a great indicator to, to forecast uh, current and future potential uh, partnerships and, and, and the health of a relationship. Now, lo and behold, we see that respondents generally have low levels of trust in the United States, um, whereby Russia is seen as the most trusted actor. Um, again, as I mentioned, Russia scores pretty high um, in, in this particular survey. And I'll, I'll say a few words later onwards about what that means and, and why Russia is, is such a trustworthy partner. Um, France and Germany, the, as I mentioned, very influential members of the EU, are viewed as much more trustworthy than the EU as a bloc. Uh, although China has territorial disputes with both Japan and India, its citizens' perceptions of both nations are notably different. So another thing we sort of try to examine is if you are familiar with the jurisdiction or if you self-report familiarity with the jurisdiction rather, um, does that engineer greater trust? We see there's a strong correlation there. So familiarity with a jurisdiction is positively correlated with trustworthiness. And that kind of makes sense. The more intimate knowledge the citizenry has uh, of a particular nation or jurisdiction, the more likely they are to trust that entity versus the, the entity they don't know very little about. Now, this holds true, except for the United States. Uh, so we do see that even though people report high levels of, of familiarity, uh, the U.S. is not trusted as much um, in, 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 in this regard. Now, another question we looked at is the long-term importance to China. Uh, so what we see here is that Russia is viewed as the most important uh, sort of entity um, in, in terms of China's long-term future. And this is really, again, in line with the general positive view of Russia throughout the survey. There's a, there's a perception that Japan is relatively insignificant to China's long-term future. We look at the EU and the US, they're seen with higher regard, uh, that they have uh, a quite strategic importance to China's long-term future. Uh, Canada and Australia are scoring in a very similar uh, manner, um, and but relative to... Uh, the U.S. and the EU and Russia, um, it's, it's quite low, relatively speaking. Um, so it tells you in, in many respects what this slide illustrates is who the citizenry believes um, plays a major role for China's future. Um, and, and, and here again, as I said, Russia, the EU and the U.S. are the top three in this, in this respect. Moving on, um, we also ask citizens about the likelihood of military conflict in the next decade. What's particularly interesting is that this public perceives the United States as the jurisdiction that is most likely to engage in military conflict with China in the next decade. Um, that should not be surprising given uh, the sort of tensions and, and the sort of rhetoric on both sides uh, towards each other um, and the sort of, um, and this, this, this permeates throughout the public's consciousness as well. Uh, Japan and India, the nations that have territorial disputes with China rank second and third respectively. And uh, we see Canada and Australia, we see France and Germany, uh, the UK uh, are seen as, as, as not uh, likely to have a military conflict in the next decade. And again, um, Russia is seen as an, the, the sort of jurisdiction less likely or the least likely to have a military conflict in the next decade. Um, so that's a sort of the general perceptions we see that the Chinese citizenry has towards these jurisdictions. Another thing we asked uh, in, throughout the survey is what do citizens believe is China's global roles? So what should uh, what sort of leadership capacity should China have uh, in, in, in the next few years? Um, so citizens were acutely asked to rate which uh, areas China should take a quote, active global leadership across eight categories of global engagement. So we've asked them about international trade, global financial standards, environmental governance, technology and innovation, education, poverty alleviation, public health, and peace and security. Um, what we did see is that peace and security is the most important issue area for the Chinese global leadership. Um, we do see that there's a lot of party slogans and party rhetoric uh, over the last few years regarding China's peaceful rise. Um, and it seems that the citizenry echoes a lot of the sort of intentions, or at least the uh, the, the sort of stated intentions of China's global rise to be one that's peaceful and one that um, preserves the global sort of order from, from, from that standpoint. What's interesting and perhaps interesting to those on this call is what was the next sort of issue area? It was technology and innovation as a key priority. Um, and here, and here's noteworthy because um, 
we do see that technology and innovation is uh, a major component of China's current five-year plan. It's also been the, the, the source of major frictions uh, between China and the West. We see this in terms of 5G technologies. We see this in terms of uh, research uh, collaborators, collaborations, um, which I'll talk about in a few moments. Um, so this is it's interesting that the citizenry believes that technology and innovation um, is an area in which China should take an active global leadership role. Uh, we see that this is somewhat consistent uh, throughout the age categories. Um, and when we look at the least important, we see global financial standards and environmental governance having the least importance. Uh, this is particularly noteworthy given that um, China has taken an active sort of leadership role when it comes to environmental governance. And there's also a, a sort of a global movement over the last two, three years to harmonize not only financial standards, but non-financial standards, uh, whereas the EU will have a double materiality standard. Um, the IFRS uh, um, is, is hoping to, to em employ that sort of non-financial standard. Um, simply put, it's not within the citizen's worldview that this is an important issue. Um, rather, it's peace and security and technology and innovation. Now, the sort of big elephant in the room is whether or not China should limit or expand corporation. Um, as I, as we sort of hinted, um, the most one of the most publicized debates uh, in, in our in our jurisdictions is, is is looking at whether we should continue to couple with China or should we have decoupling or de-risking? Uh, should we unravel uh, trade ties, supply chain, scientific collaboration, and economic interdependence? Um, so, in order to gauge the the public's the Chinese public's perception on this matter. We do ask a question, should China limit or expand economic cooperation? So rather than being especially pro or anti-decoupling, the public express a preference for expanding trade and investment relations. And they also ex express a preference for, for expanding technology and research collaboration with the majority of jurisdictions. Uh, this is quite consistent across income levels. Um, and so we see, again, Russia consistently received the highest score, whereby the citizenry believes they should expand uh, cooperation with Russia, followed by the EU, uh, which is interesting because within EU circles, you do find that uh, uh, there's hawkish sorts of comment, uh, sort of movements and comments that perhaps uh, the EU should de-risk and decouple. And I think what, ironically, the example that the EU has with, with Russia is that the, uh, the EU can potentially decouple uh, from Russia in, in, in a successful fashion, and this could potentially be translated into decoupling from China. I would caution with that, uh, with that sort of mentality because China is a much more um, uh, sort of heterogeneous kinds of relationships with the EU, where decoupling might be much more detrimental to both sides than, say, the EU-Russia example. Nonetheless, uh, we do see that Japan and India are scoring the lowest, and again, Russia the highest in, in these indicators. Um, let's continue onwards and talk about attitudes towards China's global engagement. So the survey asks respondents to rate their agreeableness between one and seven, uh, with a series of six statements on Chinese foreign affairs and global relationships. So if we look at statement one and statement two, China should currently concentrate more on domestic affairs than on global matters. China is currently too open to foreign influence and thinking. We see that the citizenry generally, um, you know, disagree, um, at least in, in, in just slightly below that four neutral score. Um, so there isn't a major sort of signifier in that respect there. Um, we, we look at statements three and four, the more a nation corporates with China, the better off those nations will be. China's relationship with Western nations will be more competitive rather than cooperative in the next decade. There's a greater agreeableness with these two statements. Um, and then finally, in statements five and six, China's political and economic model should be exported to other nations, and China should change international practices and laws to reflect norms and values that are Chinese. Um, we see a uh, disagreeableness for number five, and we see a slight agreeableness to number six. Ultimately, what, what, what I take from, from these statements is the domestic public does not have an appetite for exporting China's model globally, it, and nor do they see that values and norms is a major sort of barrier uh, to, to cooperation. In fact, they, they do not advocate um, in a very strong fashion that China should export uh, Chinese norms and values globally. So it's, it's really fascinating to see that because um, as we can see, um, 
if there is two entities that have different values and norms, and they perceive that their values and norms are the most important, it's near impossible to have cooperation. Um, and so on the one side here, we see that the Chinese do not see that their norms and values might be a hindrance to uh, future cooperation with other jurisdictions. So if we were to extrapolate that further, that's what I would suggest is some of the takeaways from, from these sort of attitudinal sort of responses. Um, okay, let's say a few more words about tourism, study, work, and immigration preferences. Um, interestingly enough, despite rising tensions uh, between China and most Western jurisdictions, uh, we see that uh, there's a strong desire by the Chinese population to directly engage with Western jurisdictions on a personal level in the next 10 years. Um, Russia is seen as one of the most favorable uh, destinations for travel, work, and immigration. Uh, the United States is seen as the most popular destination of choice for studying abroad, followed closely by the United Kingdom. Um, most immigration preferences at a statistically relevant level revolves around employment and searching for an increased income. Um, some interesting tidbits as well. Um, having knowledge in a host nation language generally played a role in the destination of choice, and that kind of makes sense when you think about that. So for those who, who know French or German, they're more likely to express wanting to visit, study, work, and emigrate to France and Germany. Um, this, of course, does not hold for Japan, and that might be for historical reasons um, that uh, the Chinese public are acutely aware of being wary of Japan through their history textbooks to, um, you know, oral sort of histories through their families. Um, when we look at uh, the, the data in a more disaggregated fashion, uh, the younger cohorts, and by young I mean age 29 and below, are more likely to express a willingness to immigrate to Germany, followed by Russia, if you're married, you're more likely to want to immigrate to Australia. Uh, individuals living in China's urban areas are more likely to want to immigrate to Australia. Um, for Communist Party members, uh, if they want to immigrate, uh, France is the destination of choice. Um, and so it's, it, it's quite fascinating from that standpoint there. Um, and the last point, I think it's quite significant as well. Having study abroad experience, so the citizens who did report having study abroad experience or not, it played no statistical role in wanting to emigrate uh, or in a general sense or wanting to immigrate to that uh, country in which they uh, they studied. Uh, so we do see that uh, there isn't that major linkages uh, between studying abroad experience and wanting to immigrate uh, to the jurisdictions we examine. Um, so the next thing I would like to talk about is Canada and China relations. And this is quite topical, of course, given that um, uh, there's been um, accusations of, of tampering. Um, and uh, there's, uh, I mean, that's made the headlines in, in, in the news cycle this week. We've seen uh, the detention to the two Michaels. We've seen Canada's, I'm oh, sorry, China's ban on Canada's canola. Um, and so there's been, you know, deterioration in bilateral relations between Canada and China. Um, trade between Canada and, and, and China has grown significantly since we've established diplomatic relations in 1970. Um, today, there's about $100 billion Canadian dollars in Canadian exports from China and about $28.7 billion in Canadian exports to China during 2022. I'm sorry, uh, $100 billion in imports and, and $28.7 billion in exports to China in 2022. Um, and we do see when we look at polling in Canada that uh, most Canadians do hold a not very favorable view of China. And of course, this has been reinforced with politicians and it's been quite politicized, calling for greater decoupling with China, uh, greater de-risking from China in terms of trade and increased scrutiny on Chinese uh, select investments and engagement um, under the guise of potential security risks. So we have this sort of, uh, uh, sort of tense sort of environment uh, when we look at Canada-China cooperation. So we asked, we asked respondents, um, you know, what, what are their views on, on, on Canada? And interestingly enough, um, we find that Chinese respondents are generally warm towards Canada. Uh, Chinese citizens have a favorability score greater than five in all areas of cooperation between Canada and China we examine. So we looked at economic and business relationships, i.e. investments in trade, uh, we looked at environment and climate change activities, and we asked them about cultural exchanges, global governance, multilateral organizations, and global and regional peace and security. 
And across all of these levels of, of engagement, we see that um, there is a strong uh, sort of um, favorability um, uh, from the Chinese sort of side. So there's, a, there's also a positive correlation between responses to increasing cooperation between China and Canada in global governance, multilateral organizations, and global and regional peace and security. Um, we can break this down a bit further, and perhaps in Q&As, I can break down many of the things I've been talking about thus far, um, but particularly the Canada-China cooperation. Um, there's a lot of information that, just for brevity, I'm not able to present, but um, we do see that uh, um, there's a there is a more of a favorable environment, a trusting environment, which which allow on the Chinese side, at least among the citizenry, which engineers and invites uh, greater collaboration between China if Canada does decide to do so. Um, one of the questions we asked is asking citizens uh, about the perceived factors that have the greatest impact on Canada and China relations. Uh, so we gave them four options to select. Um, we, we asked them if uh, China's growing international power could be a hindrance or, or deterrence or, or a positive sort of aspect towards Canada-China relations. We looked at, uh, we asked them about Canada's relationship with the United States. We asked about differences in values between Canada and China. We also asked Canada's domestic policies, um, sorry, domestic politics and policy environment. And what we see is for the most part, um, People generally tend to believe that Canada's close relations with the United States is perhaps the most uh, cumbersome variable uh, to influence Canada-China relations. The least cumbersome variable is potential variances and differences in, in Canadian and Chinese societal values. And again, that is a positive because if you if you if the if the citizenry believe that there is a a, a clash of values, it's almost um, it's 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 super difficult to engage and have a fruitful cooperation when there's a value variations between both sides. Um, so I, I think that is a positive that we can we can attach from from these results. Now moving on, um, I want to say a few words about the sources and knowledge of global jurisdictions that the citizens report. Um, well, we see that uh, respondents consider themselves to be relatively highly knowledgeable about the U.S. and Russia. This is perhaps owing to both jurisdictions' dominance in recent news cycles. But what this chart also indicates is that when there's greater knowledge of the entity or when they self-report greater knowledge of a, a particular jurisdiction, they're more likely to trust that jurisdiction. So I think that is a great takeaway. And again, ultimately, um, when you trust the entity, you're more likely to want to cooperate with the entity in the long term. So I think having that, that meaningful knowledge is a great sort of proxy to understand uh, trust currently and future trust, uh, which can lead to greater cooperation. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, because of the same realities we see in our own jurisdictions, is that irrespective of age categories, social media was the most common way to obtain information on global affairs. Um, again, across all age categories, that is a reality. It's significant. Uh, it's significant because if you look at traditional media, television, radio, newspaper, Generally speaking, the party has been quite uh, good at uh, uh, influencing the sort of uh, messaging that, that occurs in the traditional uh, sort of media. This might um, come in, 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 in the view of having um, key talking points for select sensitive issues that television, radio, newspaper may have um, to uh, downright censorship. Uh, so we see that... Uh, um, by virtue of the citizenry using social media as a way to obtain information about global affairs, there is more varied sources of information. Now, of course, this is withstanding the fact that there is censorship on social media, but um, there are ways around this. So you can walk through VPNs, through, through political memes, political humor, through code words. Um, and, and, and so we see that um, what this means in many respects is that there is uh, greater information being acquired through social media that may not be as filtered through the eyes of the party. Um, what that also suggests, if you are a, a, a foreign jurisdiction, ironically, is that you can influence the way the public uh, perceives certain issues by virtue of uh, using social media to your advantage. Of course, that is the great irony because that is the attendant fear that we have uh, towards uh, uh, Chinese-backed or Chinese-based uh, uh, so, sort of social media forums that are in our jurisdictions. Uh, 
Um, but ultimately, we do see social media is the way uh, in, in, in that, that the citizenry gets their news about global affairs. The sort of uh, last question that we ask um, that I'll present today is looking at government action in the popular will. I think this is also interesting to look at because, um, you know, ultimately, if the citizenry cannot divorce the government from the popular will, um, that can be a bit tricky. Let me put it to you in a different way. Um, often in our jurisdictions, perhaps the government may not represent the views of the entire population. They may not accurately represent the, the attitudes of the entire population. And as, and as a result, we can potentially divorce the government's action from, from perhaps our own thinking and our own sort of mentality towards a particular issue. What we see in the Chinese context amongst the citizenry is that there's broad agreement within the population that a government's action broadly reflects the citizens' will. That means if the Canadian government, for example, um, does a particular action, the citizenry believes that the majority, if not all citizens, believe that this action is, re is, is, is reflective of what the citizens want and, 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 and desire. So that is, uh, um, that is something to, to point out because it tells us that uh, when a government behaves in an X or Y fashion, um, it, uh, the citizenry believes that that is what the that 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 is what those jurisdiction citizens actually want, um, and so uh, we see this results uh, in terms of of being quite uh, um, consistent across age and income demographics. Okay, so the last sort of bit that I want to say a few words about is what does this all mean? What, I mean, talk about some of the implications uh, towards some of the, our findings in in, in, in many respects. Um, the first thing is saying is that we can suggest is that China really is at a crossroads with its interactions with major Western jurisdictions. Um, the data suggests that the public overwhelmingly supported China that peacefully coexists in the international sphere. This is demonstrable insofar that the citizenry considers global peace and security as the most significant leadership role China should take. Yet with all jurisdictions, there are numerous strategic interests to balance that could compromise this medical. Now, China's stated goal to improve its technology and, and, and research standing is the most prevalent strategic interest that can incite future global tensions. As I sort of hinted beforehand in the 14 five-year plan, the current plan, China aims to develop basic research and significant breakthroughs in core technologies to the extent that the nation could be a global leader in technological innovation. They're also increasing um, R&D investment by 7% annually. Um, um, and so... What we see here is that the that the, the citizenry overwhelmingly supports China becoming a global technology and innovation leader. Um, and so um, how would China marry both goals to be a leader in global peace and security and yet develop technology and innovation that ultimately challenges the current hegemony led by the United States as well as the European Union in many respects? Now, the citizenry does not really account for this, um, but to be fair, the public does suggest that the United States is the jurisdiction most likely to engage in conflict with China in the next decade. Now, I'm going to give you three quick charts here. And, and, and what these charts really are trying to do here um, is we have the seven scale ordered Likert questions. So we can do some scatter plots based on, uh, on, on seven by seven. Put differently, we can look at if you trust a partner, if you see uh, the United States as a trusting partner, um, how does that relate to how you see the importance of the relationship? Now, what this slide, usually you want to have something that's more in the middle of, of, of the sort of uh, individualized charts. What we see in the U.S.-China relationship case is that it's super polarized. In other words, the Chinese public, um, beyond what we should expect, uh, perceives a, a very polarized relationship towards the United States. Now, the converse occurs with the Russia example. We see that, and, and this has been a constant theme in this report uh, and in the surveys, that the Chinese public's increasingly close and favorable relationship with Russia. There's widespread uh, sort of consensus irrespective of income uh, about expanding economic ties with Russia. It's seen as a favorable uh, sort of destination for travel, work, and immigration. Uh, this viewpoint of Russia is perhaps supported mostly by Chinese social media, which, as I mentioned, is the one of the most common ways the citizenry receives information about global affairs, and it paints a quite positive view of Russia. Um, there's also a few other conditions uh, that can 
that can uh, lead towards this. It could be a very pragmatic one. And what I mean by that is, um, as the ruble has depreciated since 2014, it's become quite lucrative for Chinese to, to engage with Russia. And so uh, it kind of makes sense from that standpoint. And what the Russia-Ukraine sort of conflict has illustrated is that the, the ruble has um, depreciated even more, so it makes it even much more attractive. If you're looking post-conflict, the post-Russia-Ukraine conflict, China has strategically situated itself to benefit from uh, its sort of partnership with Russia. So in many respects, uh, uh, we see the quite the opposite sort of reality uh, from Russia and China versus the United States. And these kinds of uh, plotting illustrates that. Now, just for comparators, I'll show you Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom. Um, I'll say a few words about Canada, given where, where we're located. Uh, respondents who, who live in large cities are more likely to rank the rise of China higher as a factor uh, affecting Sino-Canadian relationships. Compared with rural respondents, people living in towns, counties, and middle cities are more willing to identify the value difference between both nations as a factor. And we also see that individuals with higher income are more likely to rank the U.S.-Canadian alliance uh, and value differences as factors that can influence. So there is some gradients to this. I mean, I mentioned some general observations, but when you dig deeper into the data, you see some general uh, sort of, uh, some specific uh, sort of observations. But ultimately, this is what we should expect when we look at Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, that there is not as much of a, um, a polarized kind of relationship that the citizenry perceives. Similarly, with the European Union, Germany, and France, we have a much more normalized kind of um, uh, relationship that we see. It's not super polarized. Um, India and Japan, we see that there's less favorability across most categories. But again, this is what we should expect. So the outliers thus far has been Russia and the United States uh, using the data analysis. So a few final words. Um, don't think we should see China's coupling with Russia as a crystallization of a bipolar global order with Russia and China on one end and Western jurisdictions on the other. As I mentioned, I think the Chinese are super pragmatic in their relationship with Russia. Um, they see that they can strongly benefit from their relationship with Russia, both economically and in other indicators that we looked at. Um, and, and, and this is even in a post-conflict with, with Ukraine um, that the citizenry can benefit from that relationship. So they're quite well situated in that respect and that regard. Um, we also see that uh, there are points of numerous interactions um, that is supported by the Chinese public that can serve as a means of bridging potential disputes between China and Western jurisdictions. Um, as I sort of mentioned, uh, that there is encouragement that the citizenry does not perceive major differences in values as a significant driver of discontent between China and Western jurisdictions, and that is a positive. It tells us that there's a lot of leeway, a lot of common ground at an ideational level, which can ultimately support common global policy goals, as well as to foster greater uh, bilateral and multilateral kind of relationships with China. Um, so that's a sort of presentation uh, of, of our survey that I, I wanted to, to share with you. Um, again, this is more of a broad overview. I'm sure you have very specific questions. I'll be happy to answer any of your specific questions or go into greater detail about any of the facets uh, that was mentioned in, in this particular presentation. So thank you.